Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, it's two o'clock Eastern here, so we're going to give folks just a couple more minutes before we get started. So grab some water, get comfortable, and we'll be right back. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Today is the fourth and final webinar of our four-part Camp Prosperity Advocacy Series. And today we're going to be talking about election year civic engagement for nonprofits. My name is Tupa Haveka. I'm the program associate on the field engagement team at Prosperity Now. And before we get started, I'd like to just go over a few housekeeping announcements. This webinar is being recorded and will be mailed to all registrants and available online within one week. Currently, all webinar attendees are muted to ensure sound quality. But again, we want this to be engaging, so please ask a question or share your thoughts at any time by typing into the questions box of your GoToWebinar control panel. And if you experience any technical issues, please email us at gotomeeting at prosperitynow.org. To get the most out of today's call, we encourage you to join us from a quiet space, grab a coffee or a snack and settle in. We want this to be engaging, so please send us your questions and comments as you listen along. And also you can tweet with us on Twitter using the hashtag Camp Prosperity. And lastly, please reflect on ways to apply what you learned today to your own work. At Prosperity Now, our mission is to ensure everyone in our country has a clear path to financial stability, wealth, and prosperity, and we do that by working in close partnerships with organizations just like your own. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Vanna Kier. She is the lead camp counselor and also the senior advocacy manager at Prosperity Now. Vanna? Great. Thanks so much, Tupa, and welcome everyone to our fourth and final week of Camp Prosperity. Um, this series has flown by this year, but we have covered um, a great deal of information that I hope has been uh, pretty helpful for you all as you either get started in your advocacy efforts or uh, begin to strengthen them as we look forward to um, our, our future legislative sessions. Uh, if you'll advance the slide, Tupa. Um, like I said, week four, we are here uh, throughout this series so far. We've discussed the basics of advocacy, values-based messaging that resonates with legislators across the political spectrum. And then last week, we discussed influencing your state's budgets in times of uh, crisis. Uh, this week, we're going to continue uh, sharing tools by discussing election year civic engagement for nonprofits. For nonprofits. It's a topic that we uh, hear questions on all the time, and so we figured we would dedicate a, uh, a session specifically to this topic. Uh, we'll focus on addressing some of the misconceptions that are out there about what nonprofits can and can't do to affect policy change in an election year. Uh, we'll talk about ways that uh, you all can engage your uh, policymakers this year, discuss things that you want to avoid, um, and just share additional resources to help you all understand some opportunities that are out there, but also some limits as well. Uh, joining us for today's webinar, uh, we are excited about our two speakers today. Um, Abby Levine, who is no stranger to Camp Prosperity, uh, she is the director of the Boulder Advocacy Initiative at Alliance for Justice. Uh, she will kick off today's discussion by talking about um, 
sort of the do's and don'ts and addressing some of those misconceptions that I mentioned. Um, we'll also be joined by Eugene Young, as you can see pictured there. He is the president and CEO of the Metro Wilmington Urban League out in Delaware, uh, and Eugene will join us to discuss um, some advocacy strategies that he has uh, deployed in his work as an advocate and just sort of talk about some of the work that he's doing there in Delaware, which, uh, which I know that will be really helpful for uh, some of you newer advocates as well as some of you who have been around uh, as Eugene is doing some great work there. Um, I also want to echo uh, what Tupa said on a previous slide uh, and lift up the, the hashtag that we'll be using for this series. Um, it's hashtag Camp Prosperity. So if you all are on Twitter, uh, we'll share some, some great nuggets of information today between Abby and uh, Eugene, and I hope that you all will um, engage on Twitter, get some tweets going, use that hashtag, and just keep the conversation going on social media. As far as our agenda today, um, pretty straightforward. I'll give you a poll question here in a second just to get a sense of who's on today's webinar. Um, and then I'll turn things over to Abby to discuss election year advocacy. And then uh, Eugene and myself will engage in a fireside chat panel style discussion uh, where he will share uh, tips and strategies with you all. After that, we will have a group discussion and Q&A. Um, as you all know, uh, for most of you who have been with us throughout this series, feel free to type your questions into the questions box throughout the webinar uh, and we'll get them answered for you at that time. So our poll question for the day, um, want to get a sense of, um, you know, if you all are here on behalf of an organization or co coalition, how would you describe your organization's comfort level with engaging in advocacy? Would you say that you all are very comfortable and that you do some high level advocacy? You've done face to face meetings with legislators. You have testified <clears throat> on committees. Um, would you say that you're somewhat comfortable? You've contacted legislators before, either by email or phone, or you've drafted petitions, you've gotten petition signatures, things like that. Uh, would you say that you're somewhat uncomfortable and that you need additional help? Um, do you think that you are very uncomfortable and you just want help getting started? Or are you in the other range? Maybe you're acting on behalf of yourself as an advocate or just don't know where you fall. So take a second to fill in this poll question. I will give you all just a couple more seconds and then I'll read off some responses here. Okay, surprisingly, uh, about 46% of you said that you're very comfortable. Um, you've engaged in high level advocacy, that's great. Um, about 33% of you said that you're somewhat comfortable. You've uh, contacted a legislator by email or phone but haven't done the high level stuff. 11% of you will basically 20, the remaining 20% of you are either somewhat uncomfortable or very uncomfortable. So a pretty good mix of folks here is, uh, in terms of experience levels. So with that, I will turn things over to Abby Levine to get us started in talking about uh, election year civic engagement for nonprofit organizations. So Abby. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Vanna. It's really great to be back at <clears throat> Camp Prosperity and to be with all of you this afternoon um, or this morning, depending on where you are. And first, hopefully everybody is healthy and safe. Um, I know these have been some trying times and this is not necessarily the year that we all thought 2020 would be. Um, but really excited that you have joined with us this afternoon to really talk about how your organization can, can get involved in the in election year activity. And for those of you who are not familiar with us at the Boulder Advocacy Program at Alliance for Justice, we are a national resource for nonprofits and foundations like all of you on today's call who want to engage more actively and knowledgeably in the policy making process. And but because of complicated regulations, we know that too many organizations aren't sure what they can do and how they can advocate to policymakers. And so we have a team of lawyers that help organizations essentially navigate the legal rules and figure out how to move from cautious to courageous. And today we're really gonna focus on election related activity, but we also have lots of resources whether your organization is looking to lobby or figure out how else you can weigh in with 
legislators and other policymakers, whether you want to get involved in ballot measures, whether you're interested in even talking with your funders about how they can support this advocacy. Know that we are here as a resource to you, not just during today's webinar, and we do encourage your questions through the chat box, but also to contact us after. And I know that you will get my, our contact information. We have a technical assistance hotline where you or your colleagues can call us or email us. And we have somebody on our team available every business day to answer questions. I will give my caveat that while we are a team of lawyers, we are not your lawyer and we can't provide legal advice, but we are available to um, work with and answer most of the questions that we get. We also have a lot of resources on our website, which is boulderadvocacy.org. And again, you will get all of our contact information at the end. So Chupa, if we can go to the next slide. As we think about this, and it just seems so fitting um, to be thinking about why it's so important to get involved in advocacy and that the words of, jo of the late John Lewis never get old and they never go out of style and they are so important now more than ever. And as he said at one point, you know, there was no sound more powerful than the marching feet of a determined people. And we are seeing that today. We are seeing people get into, as he calls it, good trouble. Um, in the streets, we've been seeing a lot of marching in communities all over the country, whether to get increased funding and support for families and small businesses as, uh, and medical treatment as a result of COVID, whether it's people marching and causing good trouble after the murder of George Floyd and looking for police reform, we're seeing lots of good trouble. And it's important for organizations to think about how we can move both from the, the streets and from the marching in the streets and move that to the policymaking process, to the legislatures, to the executive branches in your states, and also to the ballot box. And today we're going to really talk about how we can bring this good trouble to the ballot box. So if we go to the next slide, it's important to know, and hopefully you all know, that 501c3 organizations can be and arguably should be active participants in election years. Now, there are lots of ways that you can go about doing that, and we will talk about the different ways. It's important to know that there's no right way for organizations to get involved, and what it means to get involved may look different from all of you, but you can get involved, you can be actively engaged this election cycle. And if we go to the next slide, one thing that you can't do, however, as 501c3 organizations, is that we cannot support or oppose candidates for public office. And that includes specifically endorsing candidates or opposing candidates, um, but it also means comparing candidates' views on the issues that you care about in a way that makes one candidate look good or bad. And I'll say that while we often think about candidates, and on this slide, it's all of the former, many of the, most of these folks have since dropped out, but people who are running for president. But this applies to not just people running for president and running for Congress, it also applies to who's running for governor, who's running for your state legislature, and it also may involve other types of even nonpartisan races, uh, including school board races, including judicial races, if judges are elected in your state. So again, as 501c3 organizations, we cannot support or oppose candidates for public office, even if we're doing it in a nonpartisan way. And we often talk about and I'm sure in over the next 20 minutes, I will talk about needing to remain nonpartisan. But again, that is essentially a shortcut, meaning that as 501c3 organizations, we can't support or oppose candidates. Now, if we go to the next slide, you'll see that even though we can't support or oppose candidates, as organizations, we can support ballot measures. And Chupa, if you click through two more times, um, it's important to know that under state law, or excuse me, to understand that as a 501c3 organization, tax law treats ballot measure work 
as if it were another piece of legislation. So supporting or opposing ballot measures is treated as lobbying. It's treated as direct lobbying. And as 501c3 organizations, we can lobby subject to very generous limits. And we have lots more resources, happy to talk about that um, with questions. So even though we can't support or oppose candidates, we can support or oppose ballot measures. And we actually can encourage people to vote yes or no for particular measures. It's important to recognize that the states regulate ballot measure activity differently. And if you get involved in a ballot measure, there may be some state reporting that you need to know about, um, but feel free to reach out to us and we can talk more about that in more detail. But if we go to the next slide, you'll see that there's so much that we can do during election season. And you can click through um, the different pieces on this slide. Some of what we wanna do during election season is to continue the advocacy that we are already doing or the advocacy that we do year in, year out, even if there are no elections. So organizations can continue to lobby. We can continue to criticize or praise elected officials for what they're doing. So just as President Trump is running for reelection and he is the Republican nominee for president, he is also the sitting president. So when he does something or says something or issues an executive order that you don't like, or maybe you like it, you can criticize or praise him. The key is that you want to be criticizing the administration. You want to be criticizing the official action, not whether you think Trump should get another four years in office. And so it's important to recognize that you can continue doing all of the issue advocacy that you do, but you want to do it as if even if there were no election coming. And so you don't want to refer to um, an opponent. You don't want to refer to voters, for instance. It's better to talk about citizens or to talk about Ohioans rather than talking about voters. And again, the closer you get to an election, the more it's going to look like the purpose is talking about candidates. And if you have questions about any of that, you know, again, please feel free to let us know. But if we go to the next slide, you can see some of the facts and circumstances that or factors that are used to determine, does it look like an organization's communication is supporting or opposing candidates? And what's important about this is that for much of what you want to do or for much of what you want to say during the election, there is going to not be a clear yes or no answer. So whether you call us, whether you call your own organizational attorney, and say, this is what we want to do, or we want to issue this statement, is this okay? In many cases, there is not a clear yes or no, because the IRS applies a facts and circumstances analysis to what we're doing. And if you can see on the screen, there are some factors that tend to indicate that the whole purpose is that you're trying to influence the election. So that political facts are things like referring to the candidate as a candidate or targeting people in swing districts, or focusing on a wedge issue that divides candidates. Those are factors that are gonna look more like you're using them because you wanna intervene in the election, as opposed to focusing on a broad range of issues, not making mention of the candidate, and an organizational history of working on the issues will tend to show that it's not. So let's just look at some examples. And if we go to the next slide, so again, you can continue to criticize um, or praise elected officials, but you want to think about how you're doing it. So in one example, if you're if this were an organizational blog post and you're talking about the Trump administration is proposing to restrict an innovation in the Affordable Care Act that is intended to improve Medicare, um, and it's focusing on what the Trump administration is proposing, that would tend to say, all right, you're, you're criticizing the administration, but you're not talking about the election, you're not talking about voters, you're not talking about his opponent. On the other hand, if you were to do it, write a blog post, um, the piece on the bottom, Biden calls on Trump to drop ACA case in, in wake of coronavirus outbreak. Now you're starting to compare the candidates, sort of pit the candidates against each other on the issue that you care about. And now it's going to look more like 
you may be trying to say, oh, Biden is better on the ACA than Trump, you should support Biden. So again, it's important to keep all of those factors in mind. And if we go to the next slide, you can see that while we try to provide some humor in here, and this is you know, somebody shaking his magic eight ball and says, it just keeps saying, it depends. And his friend's like, oh, that's the special lawyers edition. That's what we tend to say a lot. Um, and it's because the facts really matter. And one good tip is that when you call us, when you call your lawyer, be able to explain what you're trying to accomplish. Don't just say, can we do this? And don't just have one sort of frame of how you wanna go about doing something. Because the way you may have envisioned something may not be permissible, but there may be ways to restructure your activity. And the more we can really get at what are the goals, the more we can help shape those facts and circumstances so we get to a more of a yes or we lower the risk for an organization um, than otherwise. Now when we think about what we can do during election season and if we go to the next season or the next slide, it's important to recognize that these rules apply to all of our different types of communications. It applies what is said, what your executive director says in an op-ed that she writes or an op-ed that, um, or in an interview that they provide on TV. It also is what's on your website. And it also has to do with what you're putting on social media. And anybody's social media account who's linked with the organization, that's considered to be property and a resource of the organization. And so for instance, my Twitter handle is A Levine AFJ. It is an or, a Alliance for Justice resource, and I, I can only tweet, I can only retweet what's C3 permissible. So again, if you wouldn't be comfortable putting something out on a pre, in a press release, you wouldn't be comfortable putting it up on your website, you don't want to be tweeting about it on social media. And if you can't tweet about something or post something on Facebook or Instagram or Pinterest or TikTok, you can't link to it, you can't retweet it. And so it's important to think about what you're linking to or what you're retweeting from partner organizations and to make sure that the content of the tweet or the, the substance of the message is something that the organization is, is comfortable putting out there. It doesn't mean that you can never link to a 501c4 organization or you can never link to a, a a union, for instance, but you want to make sure that the content of that you're linking to or that you're retweeting is C3 permissible. And we have lots more resources on our website about social media if you have questions about that. But if we go to the next slide, one of the areas that comes up a lot during election season, and we're seeing it a lot more this year, has to do with how can organizations provide education to candidates? How can you try to shape the candidates' positions and platforms on the issues that you care about? And there are ways that you can do that. You can provide information to the candidates that you want them to know, that you want them to have, and positions that you hope they adopt. You can provide that information. You can create a briefing book that you want the candidates to have, or you can share with them information that's that you already have white papers reports other information on your website and you can send that information to candidates what you don't want however is to essentially become a campaign staffer or a campaign consultant so if a candidate calls you and says i'm giving a speech next week can you and if we go to the next slide um for instance if we, if a candidate calls you and says, you know, I'm giving a speech next week on, you know, what we think should go into a new stimulus package for COVID-19, what should I talk about? What are your top priorities? Vanna or somebody else from Prosperity Now could say, oh, we have some really good information and we've set out what our priorities are on our website and they could send the link, they could send the document to the candidate but they would not, if they had not already made this information publicly available, you would not want to create it just for the candidate. So again, 
Our job is to, we can provide publicly informa available information to candidates, um, but you don't wanna be creating resources specifically for candidates. One of the other areas that I know a lot of organizations like to do and is so important, and this year I think it's gonna be more important than ever, is to help and encourage people to register to vote and then to get out to the polls. And there are a lot of ways that organizations, C3 organizations can do this. But our goal in doing this, and the reason that as 501c3 organizations, it needs to be to encourage people and to help people exercise their rights to vote. It cannot be because we're trying to get people to vote for certain candidates um, or for candidates who believe in, who will support particular activities. So we can do voter registration, get out the vote, but we need to make sure we're doing it in a way that encourages people to exercise their rights and rather than encouraging them to support particular candidates. So if we go to the next slide, for instance, we can target, you know, recognizing that as organizations, we don't have unlimited resources and we can't um, try to you know, register everybody. So we can target based on location and audience. We can target based on geography, but it needs to be for a nonpartisan reason. It needs to be, maybe it's the location in which your office is located. Maybe it's where you have the most members, but you can't target a neighborhood because that's a swing district or because that's where you think all of the Democrats live. Likewise, you can target your membership, your natural constituency, or you can target a group because they're a disadvantaged or historically underrepresented group. But you can't target people because you think they're going to support the pro-immigrant candidate, for instance. And so it's really important, we go to the next slide, that you're thoughtful in terms of how you're targeting and then also what messages you're using as part of your get out the vote voter registration activities. We again, we can suggest a range of issues. And if you go where we can say, you know, you can have an impact on the decisions affecting your life, register to vote now. But if we say vote green or let's end fracking in our community, that may be particularly depending on who the candidates are, may be suggesting that you're supporting one particular candidate over another. And then finally, and I know there's so much more we can talk about, but I wanna just touch real briefly on some of the ways that not only can you encourage people to get out the vote, but you can also help educate them about voting. And this year, you know, again, educating people about the process, deadlines are changing. Whether people can vote absentee or uh, mail-in is, or is changing. Um, who, what ID or what requirements are needed for voting and providing that information is really, really important. But we can also, and if we go to the next slide and actually the slide after that, if we, um, on candidate questionnaires, that we can um, <coughs> provide information to the public or pro <coughs> provide um, voter guides that provide information on the candidates' views. But the key is it's not to provide sort of a scorecard that compares the candidates and indicates which candidate is better. It's a way to help the candidates or to help the public understand the candidates' views on issues. And so we can do that through put, sending out candidate questionnaires where we ask candidates questions on a broad range of issues and then publish their responses. And we don't wanna ask biased questions. We don't wanna ask, you know, don't you agree that um, the opioid epidemic is the biggest problem facing Ohio? You can ask questions like, how would you address the opioid epidemic? You wanna ask open-ended questions. We also don't wanna ask candidates to take pledges. If elected, do you promise to support our priority issues? So we can put information out through candidate questionnaires. Um, and if we go to the next slide, where we often take the results of the questionnaire and then put them out in a voter guide. We can also, and if we go to the next slide, recognizing that sometimes we don't wanna put out written resources, but we want to have the candidates speak in person. And that could be virtually, as we're probably gonna see a lot more Zoom 
debates and forums, or maybe at some point in the future, we'll get back to in-person. And there are ways that C3 organizations can host candidate debates and forums as well. Again, the goal is not to incur to help people to help people or to encourage people to support one particular candidate or to show which candidate um, is best aligned with your organization's views. It's really to provide that basic educational focus. And then the final thing that I want to just touch on, and if we go to the next slide, is that all of these rules that we've talked about, and I know I've talked about them very quickly, and we have lots of resources on our website that go into them in more detail, but all of these rules apply to the organization, and they apply to all of you or all of us, because I work for a 501c3 as well, wearing my organizational hat or my organizational t-shirt. Um, they apply to using organizational resources. So in my individual capacity, I can support candidates, I can get involved in campaign activities, but I need to use my personal email address rather than my AFJ email address. I couldn't use my work laptop to, to get involved in campaign activity. Um, I can't use my work credit card to support campaign activities. So there's a lot that you can do in your individual capacity, um, but you just wanna make sure that again, you're using your personal email that you're not suggesting that you're participating on behalf of the organization. So that is a very, very, very quick rundown of what's possible. We also have some resources, and if we go to the next slide, that you can use to not only sort of look at, um, to, to help your organization think through not only where you are and sort of what your capacity is to engage in election related activity, but also to fully engage in advocacy more broadly. And so we have some tools, the advocacy capacity tool, as well as a short, quick version that organizations can use either alone or as part of a coalition to really take a snapshot of your advocacy capacity and to be able to look at this point in time to see what your strengths are, where your gaps are, and to think about how you might want to partner with other organizations, how you might want to look to larger networks like Prosperity Now to help fill in some of those gaps. And again, it's a tool on our website and we encourage you to download those as well as all of the other resources we have. And so with that, I'm about within my time frame, and I will turn it back to Vanna. Perfect. Thanks so much, Abby. Um, excellent job. Excellent tips, resources. For some reason, I've heard you on webinars maybe four times in the last several years. And each and every time I walk away having learned a few extra new things and having scribbled a bunch of notes throughout your presentation, you always do a fantastic job of just making things really plain. Um, I want to take a second. Uh, we've got a, a couple minutes here to, to get to some questions here. Um, and I'll just, again, ask the audience Great. if you have questions, put them into the questions box for us. Maybe I'll only get to one because I want to save time for Eugene, but also allow questions to come in. And the Boulder Advocacy Tool that uh, Abby just talked about, the ACT tool, um, we've shared it with you in the handout section of, um, of your GoTo webinar. Um, platform. So if you'll just click and, and the link's there for you all. Um, Abby, I think someone joined a little bit late and um, wanted to get clarity on um, social media use and posting sure. politics from an individual or a personal Facebook page. Um, what are the sort of rules or limits around there if the person works for a C3 but wants to post partisan politics on their individual Facebook page? Sure. So you certainly can post political content on your personal Facebook page or your personal Twitter um, account. You do want to make sure that it truly is your a personal account. Um, and so again, something that you don't use primarily for work um, and that you're not doing posting primarily during your work day. And I know right now in particular, you know, our lives are even crazier and the separation between work and home is, you know, virtually none since we're all working from home. Um, but to really think about um, 
to how to do that. So for instance, if you have a Facebook page, and even though you say it's your personal page, but pretty much the only thing you post are news alerts or action alerts from your organization, it's gonna look more like an organizational page. On the other hand, if you have a Facebook page and you post about what you're eating for dinner and about your cat or your kids and your vacation and also and occasionally you post something from work and then occasionally, you know, and then you want to post about your favorite candidate, that would be OK as well. You want to make sure that you don't link to it from anything you do at work. So, for instance, if you have a bio, you know, a link to your bio on your organizational website, you don't want to have a link to your personal Facebook page, for instance. And I've seen organizations do that. The other piece is, you know, at the top of your Facebook page or somewhere on there, it may say where you work. And you may decide that if you're posting a lot of um, political stuff that maybe you want to take that down. Maybe you want to have a disclaimer that says, you know, this, this is my personal page. All views are my own. Um, you know, we're not in the CIA, so you don't have to, you know, hide where you work. But just as you would not go to a campaign fundraiser, I hope, and walk in, you know, so for instance, I would not walk in and to a camp fundraiser and be like, hi, I'm Abby Levine. I live in Alexandria, Virginia. I work for Alliance for Justice. You don't want to lead with where you work, you know, but if I'm at that fundraiser and somebody comes up to me and we're chatting and then they're like, oh, where do you work? You know, I could say, oh, I work for Alliance for Justice, but I'm here today as an individual. Um, so you can have that on your Facebook, but a lot of this has to do with perception. And that's where, again, the it depends comes into play. And if you have questions, if you want us to take a look at your page, feel free to reach out to us and we're happy to have those more in-depth conversations with you. Awesome, thanks, uh, Abby. I'm gonna ask one more question um, that I will direct to you, Abby, um, but then also to the entire audience because others may want to chime in via the chat box. But Anne is asking, we plan to have people meet uh, by Zoom with viable candidates to talk generally about how they would plan to help struggling low income individuals and families. Do you or anyone in the chat have any sample questions that we could use for these discussions so that so we don't need to recreate? Um. I don't know. I can probably find some. And if you reach out to us, we could do that. I do want to make sure that as a C3 organization, that you are asking questions on a broad range of issues. And so, and you know, they're one of the challenges that there's no clear answer of how broad it needs to be. But again, you want to sort of make where it doesn't look like you know, where candidates are all going to, you know, one candidate may agree with all of the questions you ask and another candidate may not. So it's important to find, you know, and it may be questions talking about the stimulus. It may be questions talking about um, Medicaid, maybe talking about health care, the environment, education. And so again, and feel free to reach out to us and we're happy to talk about that in more detail. Great, and I'll also um, crowdsource your question, Anne, and ask for um, all of our webinar attendees if you all have done similar things with um, local candidates, state candidates, federal candidates, and have any um, questions that you'd offer up to Anne. Um, I would love it if you all would put them in the chat box or in the questions box, and I'll read them um, towards the end of the webinar. Um, so moving along I here, love I, yeah, I love the virtual crowdsourcing. Mm -hmm. We want to make these webinars as, as um, interactive as they can be. Um, but with that, I want to move on to get to um, our panel discussion uh, with Eugene Young. Really excited to hear from Eugene and talk about some of the work that he's doing um, at the Metro Wilmington Urban League. Um, I know that it will tie into a lot of work that some of the folks in our audience are doing and just be really helpful for folks as we think about the rest of this year and entering into next year. Um, so Eugene, happy to have you on. I want to dive right in and just um, get right to it. For starters, if you would just talk a little bit about um, the uh, some of uh, Metro Wilmington Urban League's priorities and some of the advocacy work that you do to help tie it into the folks who are on today's webinar. Sure. Um, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you, uh, Vanna. Thank you, Tupa. Thank you, uh, Prosperity Now. Uh, Prosperity Now has been a huge um uh, a guiding light to uh to our office over i would say the last um 18 to 24 months 
Um, so we cannot thank you enough. And also, I just want to throw a little line in there uh, um, in regards to the great work of Boulder. Um, I cannot tell you enough. Um, I've been very fortunate in my life. I've uh, co-founded two nonprofits, and I currently run a separate nonprofit now, worked in government um, for a while. But um, we've used the Boulder um, app. They have forms on their website. Uh, Boulder Advocacy has forms on their website where you can literally go. Um, I think of one all the time that we would constantly use when we were starting a, a, a nonprofit organization a couple of years ago based around advocacy. And it's just very simple as the 501c versus 501c, uh, 501c3 versus 501c4 form. Um, and so I would definitely advise any like nonprofit organization out there that's looking to get into advocacy. It's a quick, easy that you can keep with you just so you can say, hey, this is what we can't do or hey, this is something we can do. Um, but uh, going to um, answer your, your question, um, our, our, for the Metropolitan Wilmington Urban League, just to provide context, which will, um, I think it'll really kind of give a snapshot as to where we are right now. Um, uh, we were founded uh, roughly around 20 years ago. Um, we, uh, our office is quite unique. There's around 90 Urban League, 90, 91 Urban League affiliates around the country. Our main headquarters is in New York City. Um, uh, Mark, where Mark Morial is, Mark Morial is our national, um, the National Urban League president. But there's a variety of affiliates and. Uh, 20 years ago when uh, we had two gentlemen, um, uh, one who was a, a statesman within the state of Delaware, a statesman among statesmen, another was a gentleman by the name of Tony Allen, who's now the president of Delaware State University, um, our only HBCU here in Delaware. But when they originally started um, the organization, their intention was to focus in on research, advocacy, organizing, um, being able to provide the, the key data um, that's so, so important to, to provide community uplift. And one of the things that we found out was, uh, or they found out when they went to the National Urban League at the time, 20 years ago, um, when there was a different administrative staff there, but um, the National Urban League was not too keen on giving them the, a, uh, um, their affiliate status because most urban leagues primarily deal in direct service and then do some advocacy. Ours is quite the reverse. We are more of advocacy, organizing first, and then we also have some direct service programming. Um, so for us, um, we were kind of, we're, we're kind of uh, born or conceived in this idea of um, connecting with people around those uh, key priorities and those, those, that advocacy agenda. Um, How has that brought us to today? Well, um, we're doing a lot of things. Um, one is we have our um, uh, we have a report um, called the Pace of Progress 2.0. Um, the initial Pace of Progress was done, as I kind of alluded to earlier, um, the initial Pace of Progress was done in 2003, um, and where they focused on research around education issues within the state of Delaware, housing, uh, workforce, um, workforce issues within the state as well. And we um, that information actually, they worked with our governor at the time um, and legislators around um, working with them collectively around policy, around this research that, that it came out, make sure people are educated. We're pretty much doing the same thing. Um, little tweaks here and there, of course, but we've initiated our progress, Pace of Progress 2.0. And um, underneath that umbrella of the Pace of Progress 2.0, which we're focused, we've uh, focused on um, uh, areas of criminal justice reform and uh, also health. So we have five key issue areas, but uh, underneath all that, we're also focusing on, uh, we've created a campaign called Building People Power, where we work to uh, create a pipeline and help communities within our state to advocate for themselves um, and to advocate around core issues that are nearest and dearest to, to them um, within their neighborhoods. Um, and so we do everything from organizing, tra um, training around organizing to um, teaching people how to connect with their legislators. Um, it's been very um, instrumental as, as we move forward. So we kind of, our priorities and our advocacy stems from research and then being able to get that out to our communities and also helping them to organize within their neighborhood or their specific areas. 
Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, I want to get a little bit more specific when we talk organizing in the community um, in Wilmington and then um, in Delaware at large. What are some of the ways that you've got in the community um, and particularly the youth? Because I think uh, in our registration question, a, a few folks responded and said, I, I'd really like to know how to get the youth more involved. What are some ways that you all have gotten them involved um, in civic engagement during an election year? So that's the first part. And then I also want to get a sense of how that work will change in this age of social distancing. Great, great point. So um, we originally, um, I, I've been um, I've been fortunate to be in, in this uh, role for almost, almost three years now. Um, one of the first things that we did when I came in within the first, I would say 60 days, uh, we, 60, 90 days, we instituted two programs um that i think um that touch on your your question specifically one is um we started a fellowship program um and while many people are saying well, what are you talking about with the fellowship program how does that uh correlate to people getting engaged and civically um activated um one of the things that we've learned is um as a nonprofit, there may be parameters about the work that we can do um but one of the things that we've done is we've created um two programs one of them being our james h gilliam fellowship program uh, where we train young people and i say young people um those between the ages of 22 and 36 to 40 years old um uh those who graduate from college so we, or come out of trade school whatever the case may be but we teach them in how do you advocate for your issues right how do you make, mobilize and create a campaign? Um, we teach them everything to how do you use a um, personal narrative when you're speaking? So you're able to engage with community members and able to bring people on to some of the things that you're you're doing. Um, how do you um, how do you who who do you talk to around certain issues? How does government work? Um, so we've we've created that um, so that a lot of our young people are able to see who holds the the levers of power and um how do you how can you individually influence and impact them right so that's some uh one part of it then another part um is and we're this is uh oh this program is open for everyone um we have the ella baker black organizing group and we created that it was something that was um ella baker for those who may not know ella baker was a huge civil rights leader. Um, she was the 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 trainer that trained a lot of the individuals from the Stokely Carmichael's. Um, she worked a lot with Martin Luther King. She was very much engaged. Um, she, in my opinion, is, is part of the backbone of the civil rights movement. And there was a line that she said that has stuck with me to this day. And she said, strong people don't need strong leaders. Strong people don't need strong leaders. And um, the goal of our Ella Baker uh, Black Organizing Group is um getting um anyone who's interested um we have high schoolers involved we have um seniors involved and just specifically teaching them the tenets the cores of organizing um and one of the things that we find is um that has been the, the jump start to a lot of individuals um becoming wildly engaged and involved um, as they know like how they can impact their community. So I'll give a specific example or, or something anecdotal. But we have um, we had a young lady that came in and she came to join our um, uh, Ella Baker Black Organizing Group. She was 20, she's 28, 29 years old, mother of three beautiful children. And she came in, learned how to organize and she said, I wanna do something with this. Uh, she then goes and starts a group called um because in, in her neighborhood because of some of the issues around maternal health she started creating a group called black mothers in power um this group started out with a couple people um next thing you know they're having leadership sessions or um they're having lecture series around black maternal health they're getting panelists from all around the regions they have around 300 people at their first major kickoff event um, and now they have legislators asking them what legislation do they believe um, is the priority for them. So it's it's a we we have to also as nonprofits, I think we also need to look at um, how we can kind of um, extend out, not just think about what we can do directly, but also indirectly by training, um, getting youth youth organized and 
and giving them the tools that they need so they can go off and do amazing things that they can. The second part of all this is um, for around social distancing, one of the things that we've done is we've created, um, through our Building People Power campaign, we were actually set to launch in, um, in at the end of March. And it's interesting because we are having some prosperity now, people come up and the whole nine, and we had to change it um, because of COVID-19. So we did it online. So we had a virtual kickoff with over 160 people online where we talked to them about our research that we've um, conducted and how it is so um, important to them and their communities and how we want to, to work with them in organizing each and every person organizing within their area. So we even followed up with phone calls and we've have some organizers throughout our state based upon that. And then also we had an advocacy day uh, where we uh, invited um, a, a variety of, of legislators um, to come in and talk about some of their priorities, some of the things that they're working on, some of the community members are able to talk about some of the things that they see within our community. So it just created a forum. And we're able to get over 150 people virtually for that as well. So it's just connecting. The key right now is whether it's through um, on the virtual side or as hopefully knock on wood as we're able to get back to back in, in, in front of one another. Um, it's about meeting people where they are um, and providing them with information that is so critical to their paths forward. Awesome. Um, speaking of meeting people where they are, um, we know that it can be difficult um, right now, but in general, really, to convince people to get out to vote when they're struggling to meet their most basic needs. When you're doing mm -hmm. advocacy, when you're doing direct services, um, that's one of the things that comes up most when you talk about voting and people are like, well, I can't even feed my children. You know, it's just it's mm -hmm. hard to convince people. How do you tie get out the vote efforts into your general advocacy work um, while at the same time still working to address some of the economic challenges of the community? Sure. So um, we've uh, you know, I think people it goes back to some of the things that we we're just uh, uh, talking about earlier about meeting people where they are and um, tying in how policy impacts your life, right? Um, and it does not even have to be policy like right now. Um, it could be policy of, of the past, how that's impacted your family's life. So one of the things that we've done um, that I constantly do whenever I speak with different within different communities. Um, and this just happened two days ago. I, I told people, and people can do it now if they're near, um, if they're near their. Uh, if, obviously, you're on your computer, but if you can Google it, there's an article September 11, 2017, um, on in Forbes magazine. And one of the things that it does specifically is talk to people about how um, the median, uh, how the median wealth for Black families um, will be. Uh, zero by 2053, and the median wealth for Latino or Latino brothers and sisters will be zero by 2073. Um, and so when you go around and you have conversations with individuals um, just about, because oftentimes you'll get, well, why does, why does voting matter to me? What does, what does it matter? And you provide data as to the current um, e economic status of um, black and Latino families and other families. Uh, we have poor white brothers and sisters um, in areas of Appalachia and other places around this country as well. But once you start providing the data, I think it changes a lot of different things. It, it, people begin to um, wake up and to say, well, what do I do um, around um, around this? What, what, can, what can be done? And so being able to provide a lot of that data, some of the, some of the things that you'll find is people saying, you know what? Um, I need to, as a small business owner, I cannot just um, rely just on, you know, me just putting my shoulder to the wheel and just making it happen. I also have to recognize that there needs to be better procurement procedures within our state. So there's been some small business owners that have come to us saying, how can you help us connect with our legislators around um, these procurement issues that we, we see and we think need to be changed? So um, it all stems with um, educating, meeting people where they are, educating them on like the issues um, and then giving them um, a clear um, a, a pathway for that they can choose for themselves um, and, and kind of guiding along the way. So it's 
in this totality, it all works together. So then people are able to say, my my vote matters um, because here are my key issues. Um, and then the second part, and then um, I'll, I'll close this question up, but the second part to this is, if people need to be, uh, we need to make sure people are educated on in the areas of government, of what government can and cannot do, what areas of government can do certain things versus cannot do others. So we actually train, um, we do a training where we have, you know, like a government one-on-one. Um, I'll give an example, a quick example. You know, um, some odd years ago, four years ago, I ran for mayor of the city of Wilmington, lost by 234 votes, nobody's counting. But um, I, uh, I one of one of the things that I commonly occurred was when I would knock doors, people would I would ask, "What's your biggest issue?" And people within the community would say, "Education," and they would say, "You need to fix education when you become mayor," so on and so forth. And it would I realized how important education on these issues is because may, the mayor of our city does not have any legal um, parameters or um, ability to impact or influence education. And so that is more of a state issue here in our state. So what does that mean? That means a lot of times the anger from many of, many of our community members will be displaced by being angry, upset at one set of individuals when there is another group that, that they should be targeting their questions, anger, um, probing and, and um, ideas to, but because they did not know it, it allows them their their voices to be drowned out. So it's also about educating people about the process because that's a major um, influencer and and how a major factor in how people are able to um, advocate for themselves and believe that they have power within their own voice and their own ballot. Absolutely, and I echo that. I think too, um, as organizations, as advocates, oftentimes when we talk about training, we focus a lot on the issues and making sure people you know, can advocate for the issues and not taking a step back to make sure that people actually understand the process and mm -hmm. how to advocate and who needs to be influenced. So that's great. I'm glad you all are doing that work. And I do want to um, hop back and just say, I know that what you referenced, the article from September of 2017, that was actually a report that Prosperity Now co-authored with the Institute mm -hmm. for Policy Studies um, mm -hmm. called, it's called The Road to Zero Wealth, if anyone wants to look that up. So I wanted to plug that. Uh, moving along, I want to see, um, Eugene, how, I know you've been a candidate before, um, but you are, uh, you wear the advocate's hat right now, and I want to see how you engage candidates in a meaningful way uh, while remain, remaining compliant. I know that Abby went over, you know, a lot of ways that organizations should think about remaining compliant. How do you do that work? So, uh, we actually uh, focus in on, um, I would say, like, two two main areas. Um, one is, and we'll be doing it, doing this year is around uh, provide, providing, um, we'll be doing questionnaires just to get just, because oftentimes, and while they're very general and they're going out to every candidate, um, they they also let people know just questionnaires about what are you, where do you stand, just get in, just find out where um, a lot of the different candidates stand is important um, on certain issues. Um, and also, I think it's important because it also allows them, it lets them understand that there are people that are concerned, right? So that's the first thing. Um, and then the second thing, which we we did in 2018, we actually did a debate um, and where we um, specifically focused in on, um, uh, we did a debate of all candidates that had geographical um, uh covering our space within the city of Wilmington. And uh, I think Abby made a really good point just about how, you know, how to kind of structure debates so that it doesn't seem like you're leaning towards one candidate or another. I could give even a little insight to, um, even to the, the the individual that asked the question earlier about um, questions to be asked during the debate. But what we did was we um, were essentially the catalyst um, or the conduit for um, this for the debate. So what we did was we reached out to, um, I would say about 10 to 15 different nonprofits throughout the state. And we asked them all to provide um, six or seven questions. And so we we ended up getting a wide array of questions, almost 70, 80 questions on everything around economic development, um, uh, health, all these different things. And what we're able to do was we 
um, added everyone's questions and we put them into different sections. So there was a, a group of 10 questions around economic development, 10 questions around health, 10 questions around um, uh, criminal justice reform, so to speak. So when the moder and we got um, moderators from all these different um, agencies as well. And so now as the moderators is, uh, is asking questions, it's these are random questions from different nonprofits. So it creates that collective, um, uh, the, the understanding of a larger collective in regards to this. It's not just singling out one organization. Um, it's not singling out one candidate. Um, these are just um, questions that have bubbled up from the community and we're kind of getting them out there and we're doing it in a way so that it's not being specifically tailored. It's not um, connected to any one individual. Um, so I just wanted to, um, I, I think that's a major part of, of this whole process. And I think that it's, uh, I think that it's important as, especially as we move closer, we're actually planning our next of debates for this upcoming 2020. But um, it's, I think it's important for us to make sure that those questions are asked. And I think it's also important for us to, uh, to work um, in a meaningful way with um, other nonprofits in order to engage candidates just to see where they stand. Because oftentimes, as a candidate, a former candidate, I would say this, once you know people care about an issue, you know, candidates react, you know, and I, I believe that, you know, once they see that there's a group of individuals, a group of entities that are putting putting forth such questions, I think it changes um, their dynamic, and they also had they have a different reaction as to how they engage. So I would I would definitely say those those two things, along with voter registrations and things of that nature, but specifically around um, engaging candidates through the debate. That's what we do. Perfect. And I think you sort of hinted on my next question. And I'll remind the audience here. I've got two more questions for Eugene. So uh, thinking about everything that you've heard so far from both Abby and Eugene uh, this afternoon, please feel free to put as many questions as you would like answered in the questions box. I'm going to get to some of those in just a few minutes here. Uh, but speaking of um, strength in numbers, Eugene, and, and candidates reacting to a group of people, um, in what ways have community coalitions boosted your advocacy effort? Uh, efforts. I know that uh, several people in our registration questions hinted at wanting more information around coalitions and how they can be helpful. Um, so how do you all work together to sound a unified voice there in Wilmington and throughout Delaware? Sure. So um, that can really be seen through our Building People Power campaign. So one of the things that we did, understand the fact that we have to work um, together, it's about um, and I say this to all nonprofits, you have to have the early conversations early, right? You can't say after something's already been disseminated or you've done some work like, hey, you want to jump on this? You know, it has to be um, an early conversation um, about what some of the things that you're trying to do, how can you work together, just the, the initial, you know, working together one-on-one -on -one conversation to be had. The second part is, um, figuring out like where the synergy is. So uh, one of the things that we did with our um, with our pace of progress um, 2020 report um, that we've done is we've reached out to different groups around different issue areas. So I'll give an example. Um, for the research that was needed, we didn't go to just academia for that. We worked with our two major universities, University of Delaware and Delaware State University, but we also worked with um, uh, the ACLU helped in um, one of their um, legal uh, counselors actually helped in our criminal putting together our criminal justice piece. Another one, uh, another person from um, our major um, healthcare provider actually donated her time to work on our health piece. Um, and we we created our report using academia practitioners. So we're able to bring people around in the very beginning. And then based, around, based upon bringing people around uh, the table in the very beginning, once you start, um, once you have the research down and you want to talk about um, engagement with legislators or the specific policy that's important to the community, it lends itself to that because you already have engaged actors at the table. So we started out with 
12 to 15 different individuals representing a variety of entities across our state for the research side. And then once that research was done, it, it dovetailed into, well, now let's, how do we work on getting this information out to community? And so we're able to lean on a lot of these different um, authors of the report um, that help uh, write, in writing this report to reach out to their networks around housing or reach out to their networks around health. And so it, the, the efforts multiplied um, doubled and tripled for that matter, because we're able to connect with even more people around, not just the research, but engaging them so that they're educated on issues. And then we, um, lastly, one of the things that we did was um, we hired organizers um, to actually, um, or, and here's the other thing, we actually brought on organizers, but a lot of our organizers came from where? They came from our Ella Baker Black Organizing Group or our um, Gilliam Fellows, who we hired them because we know they know the the levers of how to pull and, and push uh, government they also understand um how to bring people together and mobilize people so we use that in-house talent in order to organize um within communities around issues so um we would have right now i'll give an example we have um an organizer um who focuses on economic development and one of the things that she does is she she's created a network of 15 to 30 people within her local community who economic development is a major important factor to them and she's worked to them with them to organize around this and how to make sure more people are educated and also creating a next steps as to well what do you want to see done and so that's created this snowball effect that's really um, helped us in moving forward. But I, I, I go to this idea that it all has to start with, and it has to be core, corely rooted in people. Um, people is is really the the nook, the crane to, to, to being able to get any of this stuff done. Um, so education, engaging, and bringing and, and, have, and connecting with people all the way through. Perfect. And I have one final question here for you, Eugene. Um, you know, you've been on both sides of the coin, uh, both sides mm -hmm. of the table here. Um, on mm -hmm. one hand, you've been a candidate and a legislative mm -hmm. staffer, so you've been in a position where you've heard from constituents and heard concerns. Uh, but now you sit on sort of the other side where you're the advocate and you're talking to legislators. What did you learn from that earlier experience as a legislative staffer, as a candidate? Um, that's helped you navigate both policy change and just this idea of building community power. Sure. Um, so the I, I, I tell um, uh, I tell a uh, tell a story all the time around 2011 when I was working in our state legislature. Um, I remember uh, getting a call from someone um about an issue um uh this uh, an issue at the time it was marriage equality at the time and i remember getting a, a call uh he was organizing this campaign and he said to me he said eugene um i know you work for two legislators um i need you to do me a favor and give me a number so i can have people call your phone from the district and i said well they can just call my number now the number i have he said no it's going to be a good amount of calls um, we've been doing a lot of grassroots work and i said okay so i gave him a number and the next day i came into the office it was 120 people for each representative that i i worked with and for while that may seem kind of small but it's not too small um of a number um, and I've worked in Delaware and I've worked in New Jersey, having 120 people call your office around a certain issue, like the office takes note of that. And especially when they're in that district um, and being able to see some of those, those efforts mobilized, um, mobilized mobilization of people um, really, and also see how it didn't really move my legislators that I worked for, but you saw how many legislators were within our caucus were chattering about how they just got 150 200 calls um about a um sp this specific issue and how that made people listen a lot more um it made them a lot more in tune to hear the thoughts ideas and um other 
um, information that was brought to the table and the bill ended up being passed. It was a long statewide effort, but that was like the beginning where I was able to see how other legislators within our, our, uh, our chamber were impacted by, um, by exactly what was going on and how so many people had reached out. And one of the things that, you know, legislators do is, and their aides do, um, and I don't care where you're from, but they'll ask, what, what, what's your address um, when you call in? And it was interesting, you know, you look up everyone's address and you find out that not just are they 100 people or 150 people, but there are 150 people from that representative's district. And it changes everything because it's not something to get, you know, a, a bunch of calls from out of state or from another area of people in solidarity. But when you have people within that community, it changes things. Um, and so um, seeing that at an at a early um, in my career really kind of shaped how I saw people in the involvement of individuals individuals, how it impacted things. And, and also um, building, for me personally, building my campaign around that kind of aspect of connecting with people, working together as a, as a larger collective and understand that it's not necessarily, while money is important, research is important, people and is, is the most important. And understanding the fact, and this is something that we all as nonprofit um, uh, executives and so on and so forth have to understand. It's um, going back to the Ella Baker um, quote is, um, strong people don't need strong leaders. So the stronger we we can help and um, the more we can help in making our community that much more stronger, um, the easier it is to pass get uh, legislation passed that impacts our community in a, in a positive and effective way. Um, the easier it is for a lot of our um, nonprofit executive directors um, in moving forward. So I think it all has to boil down to like, working to let people know how much power they have because i think right now one of the biggest issues is that people feel is that, and that they don't have any power which is the furthest from the truth absolutely thank you and i love that quote by ella baker so i'm glad that you repeated it so that i could write it down mm -hmm. um Eugene, thank you so much um always happy to have you on to share your incredible uh work the insights that you have i know that you've been doing some great work there in delaware and i wanted to share that with our larger network. I knew I threw a lot of questions at you, so take a break, get some water really quick, and then I'll throw <laughs> more questions at you from the audience. Um, as a, uh, we're going to move on to the discussion piece, the uh, Q&A por portion of today's webinar. So uh, if you all have questions, feel free to put them into the questions box. So I am just going to uh, proceed forward and just answer as many as we can before the time runs out on us. So I'll start with you, Abby. I'm going to try to read this question here from uh, Carmela. Um, and then Abby, I'll let you take a stab at it. As we set okay. to figure, as we set to figure out what path would work best, is there a conflict to a handful of advocacy C threes, C three organizations, to support initiatives monetarily that would address inequities to change the course of how issues are handled, as well as to ensure this support to affect change? So I think she's asking, is there some sort of conflict with organizations banding together raising money? To, to support specific issues? Not at all. And it's a great thing when organizations work together to raise money to support the work, to do the work, um, recognizing that more and more, you know, we're all really intertwined and no one organization can do this work alone. No one organization is response, can be responsible for the policy change and how do we sort of tap into all of our organization's strengths to do that um, the best way. And I think as Eugene was talking about one of the, as he you know highlighted one of the great things about the candidate forum that he did was getting, you know, asking different partner organizations to submit questions to be able to get that broad range, just an example. So as an org C3 organizations, you can partner together to raise money to support advocacy efforts. The key will be that the work that you support has to be C3 appropriate work. And so C3 organizations could not get together, raise money to then try to, to give that to an organization to endorse a candidate. Um, so you have to make sure that the C3 money is used for C3 permissible purposes. But as we've talked about, there's so much that C3 organizations can do that that money can be put to really good use. 
Awesome. Thank you, Abby. Um, and thanks, Carmela, for a great question. Um, another question here um, that I think I think I alluded to it earlier that many people have, and, and Eugene, you touched on a, a little bit earlier. Um, mm -hmm. How do you work, how do you work with voters who might feel disempowered by politics? Great, great question. So um, I I think we've got to um, we have to first thing we we do is we don't give up. <laughs> that is the that is the very first thing we. We cannot give up because oftentimes we'll have conversations with individuals and uh, often, you know, people will say, well, I'm not doing it because of the X, Y, Z. Um, and then oftentimes it, you know, uh, we shut down, right? Because it, it almost seems like a, a lost cause. So I think the, the key is how do you relate it to what is going on in that individual's life um, at the present moment? Um, and if someone starts talking to you long enough, you'll have you you can easily pick out um, areas where you know what this is um, this is something that you need to uh, this is a reason why it's important to vote. Whether it's around criminal justice reform, whether it's around um, health, all these different issues, and you can bring up legislation in the past. Um, I, I use a a. Um, an anecdotal line about just my family um, all the time and how my great grandparents moved to Delaware, one from South Carolina and the other from uh, um, Georgia in 1920s, early 1920s. Um, and they were, um, he was, my great grandfather was 24, my great grandmother was uh, 19. They lived here uh, during the Great Depression. And then I give examples of how um there was legislation that was passed during the great depression everything from the social security act um of 1935 but i it un let people understand how policy is so important because my great grandmother who was a domestic at the time for 35 years um was one of the two sets of workers that could not um qualify a, to enroll into social security one being agriculture and other being domestics and so i i explained to people how that links to the policy of that is has a direct implication on the work that was done prior prosperity now as that race to zero the uh, around the wealth gap um so i think it's about tying into what's going on right now what has happened in the past into policy and then the second part is understanding like you i think people oftentimes forget but like your vote really matters um as someone that came 234 votes short um of a, a mayor race like it it really does matter every vote does matter and um there are situations across the country where you can see where a vote here or a vote there um or um uh under engagement here or engagement there can change things and so whether it's you know your way or the other way so i just press upon people of, of the policy and then also how um, you can just look nationally to see how you know race may be determined by X amount of votes. Um, and you can see where your vote actually does matter. Absolutely, I echo that Eugene. And also um, wanna, and I think you alluded to this a little bit, but just demonstrating um, wins within the community, what policy wins or even policy losses for that matter. What was the results of, you know, folks not getting involved in certain policies or demonstrating the effects of, of voting in the community. You know, this T-SPLOS that was on the ballot last year, it passed. So what does that mean for our community? Look at the effects of it two, three years later. So just making the connection with people I found uh, is really helpful for people who feel disempowered because a lot of times, and, and rightfully so, that disempowerment comes from sort of the, the nasty fighting that we see on television all the time. And, mm -hmm. and the, the effects of policy really gets lost in a lot of the fighting that we see. So just making those connections and tie it back in, tying it back into, you know, the actual tangible things that we can see in the community happening as a result of policy. Absolutely. Um, so another question here, um, what are some resources you use to educate voters? Um, Eugene, if you want to take a stab at that, add sure. as well. Sure, I'll, I'll give a quick one. I'll, I'll pass over to, to Abby because um, they do a lot of educating. <laughs> they, they've helped us out a lot. So um, first thing that we, um, what do we do to educate individuals? So one is um, provide them with uh, data. Um, I think is, you know, it's important for people to realize 
and to see whether um, the the thoughts, the feelings, and the ideas that they had that they're that they're concrete and they're real, right? Um, so we we really undergird and anchor ourselves in this idea of how do we get data to um, the community. So it's not whether it's something that the Urban League likes or not. This is just what the data proves. This is what the data says. Um, and that's around every issue area. Um, and so I would say that the best thing to do is um, partner up with your local, um, if, if, because even if you may not have the bandwidth within your specific nonprofit, um, having conversations with your local um, academic institution um your local university or your local college um talk to them about um some of the things you see have a conversation with the deans of different schools um because many many times they have research already on these issues um and their biggest problem is their struggle to get it out to community so there's a um there's this dovetail of of, of ways to to work together by being able to kind of um, get information and then share with community. And then the next phase of it is like providing the feedback um, so that you're you're connecting, you're the conduit, you're connecting that um, that or that full life cycle of here's what the research says, this is what the community feels, here's some ways that we can move forward um, to together um, based upon um, specific research and data. Um, but I think the key is just being able to present it, um, being able to work with, and other nonprofits that may have the bandwidth can may have a lot of the data for your individual area as well. Great, thank you, Eugene. I've got a couple more questions here. Uh, Abby, it looks like, I think this one is going to be for you. Um, what are some of the negative consequences? We certainly hope no one crosses this line, but what are some of the negative consequences if an organization engages in a advocacy activities that are not permissible? Sure. Well, I think, you know, one, and I'll get, I'll answer that directly in a minute, but I think in many cases, one of the bigger risks that we see in the nonprofit community is organizations not speaking out and not getting involved in the issues. And so the voices of the people um, of your constituents, of your members, often are not part of the policy making process. And I think too often that's the bigger risk um, than, than anything in terms of the compliance side. The Ultimately, legally, if a 501c3 organization is found to have supported or opposed a candidate, it could lose its tax exempt status. But the enforcement at the Internal Revenue Service is very, very, very lax. And it's very rare that that happens. And there are basically sort of no, you know, we the, the rates of audits, the rates of investigations are very, very low. We're starting to see a little bit more effort at the state level and depending on what state you're in there's a little bit more enforcement but i think more importantly it's important to build in a culture of compliance and to be sort of looking at these rules because more than the the internal revenue service or more than a state ag's office attorney general's office the it often becomes an issue of public perception and if an organization or if there's somebody out there who doesn't like the mission of your organization or thinks that you're being too effective, frankly. They're looking for ways to stop you and they're looking to put hurdles in your way. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to raise questions about whether an, the organization is operating uh, appropriately. And so it's important to understand what's possible. And the more you understand what's possible, frankly, the more bold you can be and the more aggressive you can be in your advocacy since you know where the lines are. Perfect. Um, along the same lines, Abby, another question for you. Um, where do you go to find information on state laws around ballot measure advocacy? I know that you mentioned that earlier. Sure, so we have information on our website for about 32 states, many of which are ballot measure states. Um, and you can go to our website, boulderadvocacy.org, go to the research resource library and search under states. If you don't see your state, 
email us and we can try to connect you with somebody or find those right resources. Um, the ballot measure rules are often governed by the state, it's either the state ethics department or the state campaign finance department. It varies from state to state, but please feel free to let us know and we can help connect you. Great, and then final question here, and then I wanna to get to sharing you all's information um, for our audience in case they have additional questions. Um, when it comes to candidate education, what is the most impactful way to reach candidates and share our issues? Um, and then I think the second question here, and more importantly, should we reach out to candidates who don't align with our issues as well? So any thoughts there on, um, you know, still educating candidates who may not agree? I would say, I, I yes, 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 and yes. Um, I think um, we should never, because there's there's so many, there's there's so many issues out here that while um, there may be um, there may be a legislator that may not agree with you on four things, he may agree with you on the fifth, um, and you you never want to uh, you know in most in most especially when it comes to politics you know um, as uh, a mentor of mine, older brother of mine, one used to always say, all business starts with relationships and. Um, I believe all policy and advocacy um, in many cases starts with relationships and people, right? So um, having that, still having a conversation and letting he or she see your face and you seeing he or she face is, is, very, is very important. So absolutely engage, absolutely have conversation. Um, and then you never know when you may be on the same side um, of a specific policy issue but please, please engage. And then secondly, um, if it's uh, one of the things that I've seen that's been very important as well, or very helpful as well, is when um, groups of citizens um, of a legislative district just show up to the legislator's office. Um, in, uh, in, I mean, there's some states that, you know, if you're in, um, not every state, can, every individual can make it to the Capitol all the time, but being able to come in and be able to show their faces like we're willing to come here to talk to you about this issue. Um, I think that that oftentimes means uh, a lot to a lot of different um, legislators. So please never uh, always engage, always lean towards engaging. Um, I think it's, it's, it's so much better that way in the end. I completely agree with that. And you never assume that you know, somebody may be completely against you. It may be doing your homework and figuring out who the right messenger is or finding what you have in common, um, but that can be really important. And then just from the side of dealing with candidates, as a 501c3 organization, you want to reach out to all of the candidates or all of the viable candidates, um, even if you don't think you know, you think, oh, there's one candidate who's never going to agree with us. Legally, you still want to offer to, or you still want to send the information to them. So again, there are lots of reasons. And the more you have your information out there, the better it can be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I agree with both of those points. Um, and I say all the time, I encourage advocates to, to continue to engage those who may not agree with you. Um, you know, people won't necessarily disagree on everything. You may find you do share some common ground on some small things. And a, a great example of that is, is the environment that we see right now. You know, you've got legislators who five to 10 years ago would, would not, we wouldn't have thought would ever be speaking out and talking about racial wealth inequality or economic inequality and those types of things who, uh, because of the climate that we're in and the protests that have that have been happening around the country all, are all of a sudden making statements or at least acknowledging that a racial wealth gap exists and acknowledging that economic uh, inequalities exist and persist around the country. So you just never know when people will, when things will, will hit home for legislators and begin to resonate and they'll begin to reach back out to you for more information that you may have tried to share with them years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to just uh, move on and make sure people have your contact information. I know we're run running out of time. Carmela, I see you asked the question, and I don't think I'm going to get to it because it's really long, but I encourage you to use this information that's on the screen here. If you all want to screenshot this uh, screen to keep in touch with Abby, Eugene, or myself uh, with additional questions that you may have, uh, feel free to do that. And then as far as next steps, just want to encourage you all to complete uh, the follow-up survey. We always want feedback on what you thought about uh, the series as a whole. 
Uh, if you haven't already registered for the 2020 Prosperity Summit, I encourage you all to do so. It's going to be virtual, but it won't be lacking um, in terms of content. Um, we've got some great speakers lined up, um, some great elected officials, some great um, you know panelists that you may have seen on news networks. Uh, register for the summit. I have a slide here coming up that shows you the link. Um, and then just visit Prosperity Now's website for more resources uh, and information. I also encourage you to visit Boulder Advocacy's website as well as uh, Metro Wilmington Urban League to uh, see some of the things that they've got going on. And I see that we're flipping rather quickly, but also want to encourage you all to go to um, our advocacy center and take action on any of the issues that you see here if you're looking for quick and easy ways to get involved in advocacy. Uh, and then lastly, want to share uh, a little bit more about the virtual summit where you can go to register uh, is there on your screen. So I certainly, certainly hope to uh, see you all online here in a couple months uh, at the end of September on our virtual summit. So with that, I want to thank you all for joining our Camp Prosperity series this year. Uh, there's so much going on in the world, um, but I'm thankful that the thirst for advocacy is still there across the country. Um, it's been a great series. And I also want to thank Abby. Uh, and Eugene for joining us, an incredible session to close out this year's 2020 Camp Prosperity. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Deep thank beyond. you. Mm -hmm. With that, uh, you all have a great rest of your afternoon and a great rest of your week. Um, and hopefully we will see you all at the summit in a few weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.